Tonight, the hit that stunned the world. Will Smith lashes out, assaults Chris Rock, then claims an Oscar in tears. I want to apologize to the Academy. I want to apologize to my, all my fellow nominees. Also a boost for first home buyers in the budget and savings at the petrol pump. Health alerts as suburbs are covered in smoke. With a warning, there's more to come. A brave Melbourne couple finally rescues their baby from the Ukraine war zone. Buddy Franklin gets his 1,000 gold ball back from a cheeky fan. And sporting stars shocked into action after the death of Shane Warne. Live from Melbourne, 7 News with Peter Mitchell starts now. Good evening. The Academy Awards have been thrown into chaos by a bizarre attack. Actor Will Smith stormed the stage and assaulted comedian Chris Rock over a joke about his wife. It prompted calls for police to lay charges, but that's already been ruled out by the LAPD. They promised the biggest show in town, but this wasn't part of the script. Jada, I love you. G.I. Jane 2, can't wait to see it, all right? Will Smith laughing at first at a joke about his wife's shaved head seconds later. Uh-oh, Richard! <laughs> oh, wow! Wow! Will Smith just smacked the shit out of me. Nervous laughter as the room tried to guess if this was a skit. It wasn't. Wow, dude. Yes. It was a G.I. Jane joke. Keep my wife's name out your mouth. I'm going to, okay? That sent a Hollywood room into silence and the Academy to momentarily go to black. Pinkett Smith announced last year she's struggling with alopecia, hair loss that she could no longer hide. Her husband's rage delayed until he saw her reaction. What viewers didn't see during the break, Smith being cooled down by Denzel Washington and comforted by friend Bradley Cooper. But just 40 minutes after his impromptu Oscars fight night was seen around the world. Will Smith! Smith was back on stage, best actor for playing Venus and Serena Williams' dad in King Richard. Richard Williams um, was a fierce defender of his family. A role Smith's apparently taken to heart and hand. In this business, you got to be able to have people disrespecting you. And you got to smile and you got to pretend like that's okay. Thanking the tennis um, family. Art imitates life. I look like the crazy father, just like they said. And to everyone else. I want to apologize to the Academy. I want to apologize to my, all my fellow nominees. I hope the Academy invites me back. Thank you. <laughs> as viewers lit up social media, questioning why Smith wasn't escorted out, even why he wasn't immediately charged with assault. This was not the comeback the Oscars were planning for and the fallout will likely continue for days. Los Angeles police have already responded, saying to take the matter further, Chris Rock would need to file a complaint. I just don't see any reason for people to go up and... If somebody insulted my wife in the way it happened, you know, I'd, I'd be pretty, pretty angry myself. A plot twist so big, viewers almost forgot about the awards. Wow, listen, I'm so happy this award's up early so I can get out and get to the bar. Melbourne's Greg Fraser, Best Cinematographer for June. Nicole Kidman lost out to Best Actress Jessica Chastain. Adelaide's Cody Smith McPhee, runner-up to a crowd favourite. The first deaf male supporting actor for his role in CODA. This is dedicated to the deaf community the CODA community and the disabled community. This is our moment. Okay, CODA. <laughs> it also won Best Film, but it's one shot that every moviegoer is talking about and likely watching again. In Hollywood, Ashley Mullaney, 7 News. Millions of Australians could save up to 20 cents a litre on petrol as the Morrison government targets cost of living relief in tomorrow night's budget. There's also support for first home buyers trying to get a start in the property market. The Prime Ministerial limousine of choice today, a whacking great truck, as he spells out a well-known home truth. It's hard to buy a home. 
especially for young Australians trying to crack the property market for the first time. I remember this when Jenny and I were buying our first home and it was, no, it was, it was, it was hard back then. I believe it's harder now. To make it easier, tomorrow's pre-election budget will extend the first home buyer's guarantee from 30,000 to 50,000 buyers a year, buying homes of up to $750,000 with just 5% deposit and no mortgage insurance. It's going to open up the ability to borrow and to buy property for the first time to a lot of Australians. And with the prices of food and other staples rising, cost of living bonuses believed to be of $250 for low and middle income earners and possibly pensioners. And the fuel excise to be cut by between 10 and 20 cents a litre for six months, putting most petrol prices back below $2 a litre. But motorists could be hard to please. So 10 cents, I mean, what's that off a full tank? Five bucks. <laughs> a bit more would be good, yeah. I don't think my vote would change on that, yeah, because it's not much. It'll cost billions that would have gone to roadworks to compensate an extra $18 billion on infrastructure, but over 10 years. Seven News can reveal the budget will show unemployment falling below 4% by mid-year, much sooner than current predictions. As economists warn, the big spending will force inflation and interest rates higher. Labor accuses Scott Morrison of trying to buy his way back into power. Australians will be quite rightly cynical about this government's motives. This Prime Minister only holds a hose if it's spraying borrowed money on the eve of an election. Though Labor admits it would spend the same on different priorities. And political editor Mark Riley joins us now from Canberra. Mark, the government's released fewer budget leaks than in previous years. Yeah, it has, Peter. We've got a general idea about the cost of living relief, but the total package and just how it'll be delivered remains a mystery. I am told, though, that there will be a number of other significant announcements tomorrow night, including a big dollar commitment on national security that might shake things up politically and massive reductions in the headline numbers, debt and deficit both down considerably and job numbers climbing even higher. But the Treasurer is keeping the details of those secrets up his sleeve to make a bigger bang tomorrow night, I think, Mitch. Mark Riley in Canberra, thank you. The Andrews government claims Victorians will be shortchanged in this budget. Billions have been promised for road and rail, but the state government says it's mostly old news. Jacinta Allen used her kindest words on the smallest Victorians. Oh, you'll be a very handy person to have around. And saved her fighting ones for the grown-ups in Canberra. As we've seen on so many occasions under, under federal Liberal national governments, we see Victoria being shortchanged. The federal budget promises a $3.3 billion spend on infrastructure in Victoria, but... Of that 3.3, two-thirds of that money was announced last year. We're having that $2 billion reheated. The Commonwealth still has $4 billion set aside for the scrapped East-West Link, but the state government wants that money used on its other major projects. Sadly, that uh, money continues to sit in that locked box. We have 18% um, of funding that's allocated from the Commonwealth for a, for a state that has a quarter of the nation's population. I mean, that's not a fair and equitable distribution of, of the funding. Matthew Guy was surrounded by all things sweet today. That's pretty good. But was sour on the Andrew government. Jacinda Allen has blown out major projects in Victoria to the tune of $24 billion. Now she's demanding more money. How about grow the hell up, manage your own projects and then start having it out with other people. Premier Daniel Andrews has tested positive to COVID. State political reporter Sharnel Vella joins us now. And Sharnel, the Premier began to feel unwell this morning. That's right, Mitch. He had a sore throat and a mild temperature. That prompted him to take a rapid test before he headed off for work and that test has come back as positive. He will remain isolated at home for the next seven days with his family, being his wife Catherine and his three teenage children. They have all tested negative so far. It does, however, mean that the Premier won't be able to attend the Shane Warne Memorial on Wednesday night. He will, however, be back in time for Parliament to sit next week. In the meantime, taking over the reins will be Deputy Premier James Molino. Mitch. Chanel Vella at State Parliament, thank you. We're being warned there's more to come after planned burn-offs left suburbs covered in smoke, triggering health warnings. Blake Johnson, we're told the burn-offs are critical to avoid fire disaster, but they are not without problems. 
And it is all in the timing, Peter. Autumn is really the only window to burn off thousands of hectares of bush. We have dew in the mornings and relatively low temperatures during the day. They make for ideal conditions, not so ideal for those living with respiratory issues. From the bay to the hills, a smoky start to the working week. This is why. Planned burn-offs across the state. This one just outside Healesville. In Montrose, it was hard to tell cloud from smoke. At 8.45 this morning, Donvale's air quality was rated second worst in the world, behind Delhi in India. Chadston was fourth, Box Hill sixth. Our autumn, the best time to do it. It's a bit like a circle right around the metropolitan area. So what we're seeing is, with whichever way the wind's coming from, we're seeing some of that smoke settle. COVID testing in Croydon called off because of smoke. Some parts had rain to wash it away. A southwesterly wind cleared much of the smoke by the afternoon, but there is more to come. Forest fire management is planning more burns over the next five weeks. If we miss it, then that hazard reduction may not happen. It may not happen for a year or two years or three years. Staying inside is the safest way to avoid smoke. Air quality is reported on the EPA website. Blake Johnson, 7 News. Police are tonight still trying to work out why a man jumped from a crane into the Yarra. He sparked an urgent search after being spotted plunging into the river at Docklands just before 7 o'clock last night. Five hours later, a Geelong man was found at a bridge near Montague Street where he was treated by paramedics. A Melbourne couple has successfully evacuated their surrogate baby out of Ukraine and into neighbouring Moldova. Jess, Kev and baby Alba were transported in an ambulance from Odessa, crossing the border with the help of Australian officials. Baby Alba was born premature two days before Russia invaded. She remains in neonatal intensive care with plans to fly her to Australia when she's stable enough. Air raid sirens have sounded across Ukraine after sporadic Russian missile strikes, not just on military targets, but again on residential areas. The bombs came down just hours before another round of peace talks, with Ukraine preparing to compromise. A Ukrainian fuel depot and defence plant, the target of Russian cruise missiles. Moscow claims a further 67 military facilities were hit, vowing precision strikes will continue as the Ukrainian fightback rages on. Ukraine's president told Russian journalists he's willing to discuss adopting a neutral status, giving up a future in NATO for peace. I understand it's impossible to force Russia completely from Ukraine territory. It would lead to a third world war. That's why I'm talking about a compromise. In the Donbass, this separatist leader wants a referendum to become part of Russia. The eastern region has been held by Russian-backed forces since 2014. It's where Moscow is now claiming to be focusing efforts. Intelligence now suggesting President Putin is trying to split Ukraine in two. As American officials scramble, trying to clarify their position after President Biden said Vladimir Putin can't stay in power. Mr. President, were you calling for regime change? No. We do not have a strategy of regime change in Russia or anywhere else for that matter. In a suburban Kiev bar, local reservists who've been called up. Everyone is pitching in, the community banding together. It feels not dissimilar to what you'd see with volunteer rural firefighters in Australia. This isn't a fight against a natural enemy, but an enemy state. You're teaching people here the skills they need, aren't you? I'm teaching people to be soldiers, he says. I'm teaching people to kill. This is effectively the gateway to Kyiv. The Russians made it well past here into the city in the first days of the war, but they've been pushed back and they keep being pushed back further. In peacetime, the local commander is a criminal lawyer. Everyone around here is working together to protect Kyiv, aren't they? It's a holy war for Ukrainian people, he says. They're protecting the capital from the Russians in Irpin, where people are being pulled from the town after days of heavy fighting, a seesawing battle for control. We cannot trust them. At the moment, we don't see any withdrawal of Russian troops from certain areas of Kyiv. Instead, Ukraine now believes depleted Russian soldiers around the capital are being rotated out north to Belarus with fresh supplies, ammunition and soldiers coming in.
And Hugh Whitfeld joins us now from Kiev. Hugh, this will be the sixth round of peace talks. Peter, they'll begin shortly in Istanbul. Turkey is a NATO country, but President Erdogan does seem to have the ear of President Putin calling on Russia to make an honourable exit. Volodymyr Zelensky seems willing to uh, keep uh, Ukraine neutral, give up NATO aspirations and wants to put all of that to a referendum if Russian troops leave. Not on the table, though, Crimea, which Russia annexed back in 2014 and seems likely to hang on to. These will be the first talk since Moscow said that it was wanting to shift the focus of its so-called military operation to eastern Ukraine, only to continue to bomb the west of the country. Mitch. Hugh Whitfield in Ukraine. Thank you. A man and his five dogs have been killed after they were swept into fast-flowing floodwaters in Queensland. Another man managed to get to the roof of his car after driving into floodwaters and was saved by rescue crews. Now I'm OK. I'm just think about the, 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 if the water comes more, the, the car move. I don't know where it goes. Parts of southeast Queensland have received more than 100 millimetres in the past 24 hours, with more heavy rain on the way. Footy's most valuable ball is back in Buddy Franklin's hands tonight. The die-hard Swan supporter turned his back on tens of thousands of dollars to return the Sharon kicked by Buddy for his 1,000th goal. The ball Buddy booted into history bounces back. This is the ball, mate, so uh, happy to give it back and I'm um, so excited that it's going back to Buddy in the club. So. Really appreciate it. There you go, Thank mate. You. Awesome. It's nice of Alex to, to give the ball back. Yeah, it was a, a special, really special night um, and to receive the ball back uh, means a world to me. The legend becomes a mortal. On Friday night, as Buddy celebrated, Alex Wheeler took a specky. So I went head over biscuit straight onto the head and, um, you know, it hurt my head. <laughs> he slept with it. I just got too paranoid that someone was going to knock the footy off from my house, so I went home pretty early and cuddled it up to bed. He always intended to return it. It's going to be no good to me. I don't have a pool room to put it up in, unfortunately. He got a different sign, ball, boots and jumper. But if he'd sold the original ball... I'd say 50,000 without any problem at all. And if, if uh, Lance Franklin signs it, then two, three, four, five times that amount. In Friday's crush, Buddy was surrounded by security guards in swans caps and never felt threatened. At no stage for me personally was I nervous or scared of, of the crowd. It's just an ugly look, I think, from a player's view. I think it's something that we can... Um, you know, we could have and, and should have potentially done a bit better than what we did. I was lapping it up, to be honest with you. <laughs> it was just a special moment. Absolutely loved it. Nick McCallum, 7 News. From one milestone man to another, Tim Watson, it's Joel Selwood's turn to shine. It is Mitch, ahead in sport here from the Cats captain as he prepares to overtake Steve Kernahan as the most capped skipper in AFL history. We'll also get Stick's reaction. How the Demons are passing on premiership tips to their AFLW counterparts. And Mitch Dan Ricardo is headed for Melbourne, but he's got plenty of problems too. Indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. We'll see you a little later. Security camera footage has provided a new insight into a deadly night in Paran. Next on 7 News, see video just released by the courts. Also coming up, a driver flees after an expensive pile-up in Melbourne's southeast. And a little battler's special honour as she fights to help children who need it most. A court has released video showing an angry teenager being kicked out of a Paran nightclub hours before a deadly drive-by shooting. It's alleged the young man's half-brother returned to the love machine and opened fire. Forced out of the Love Machine nightclub by a group of security guards, 17-year-old Ali Magni is pushed onto the street. The fiery exchange occurred just hours before a deadly drive-by shooting at the club, allegedly involving Magni's half-brother. After being ejected for rowdy behaviour, Magni allegedly told bouncers, I'll be back. He then took an Uber to see his father, the late Nabil Magni, before he says he fell asleep. 
When he woke, security guard Aaron Osmani and patron Richard Arrow were dead. Magni's brother Jacob Elliott and friend Alan Fares now standing trial for murder. Today, police told a jury of the chaos that ensued after shots were fired in April 2019. One officer recalled how she tried to help 28-year-old Arrow after he was hit in the head. I had a first aid kit and I asked somebody who was holding his hand, what does he need? They said, I think it's too late. Security vision of the moment Richard Arrow and Aaron Osmani were shot was shown to the jury today. Despite desperate efforts to save the men, the court heard both died in hospital. The trial continues tomorrow. Estelle Greepink, 7 News. An Audi driver is on the run after crashing into parked cars in Melbourne's southeast. The Audi Q5 hit three vehicles on South Road at two o'clock this morning. The driver had fled by the time emergency services arrived at the scene. Three people have been arrested at a climate change protest in Melbourne's west. Tools were used to extract members of the Extinction Rebellion group after they used concrete to chain themselves to a 44-gallon drum. And a Greenpeace protest was held outside AGL's head office, calling out the energy giant for climate pollution. One of the faces of the Good Friday appeal was given a special new role today. Isla McGann got straight to work with CFA volunteers at Doreen as they praised the brave little girl. Reporting for duty, honorary firefighter Isla McGann quickly adapting to her new role. The eight-year-old is one of the faces of the Good Friday appeal. In remission after fighting acute lymphoblastic leukaemia, today Isla became a firefighter at Doreen. It was so much fun. The most favourite part of the day? Um, getting my own hanger. Her little uniform among 90 of the volunteers at the station. A lot of our members have actually had uh, children in the Royal Children's Hospital over the years. Um, two of my grandchildren in particular just want to help. We just we see the, the things the kids go through and everyone just wants to chip in. We wouldn't raise as much money as we do for the Good Friday Appeal if we didn't have all these guys out there with the tins on the roads. CFA volunteers will be making a return to the appeal this year, collecting donations from all over Victoria in their fire trucks. Back rattling the tins with new recruits ready to go. I think it might have been a bit of a um, like life-changing day for Isla because we're in the truck and she's like, I want to be a fireman. <laughs> what do you think you want to be when you grow up? A, a singer. <laughs> Not a firefighter? No. Well, when I'm 12. <laughs> Tick and Dolling, 7 News. Great to see the CFA back on the road. Mm. Jane Bunn joins us now. And, Jane, what can we expect this week? Oh, Mitch, it should get cooler as it goes on. A proper taste of autumn. Cloud built late yesterday. A stunning sunset that led to a stunning sunrise. And red sky in morning. Sailors and shepherds take warning. But all we saw after that was grey skies and some weak showers. That all cleared out to late afternoon to sunshine. And it is dry in the Melbourne area tonight. From Brisbane to Sydney, it is pouring once again and Gippsland may see some of that in the days ahead. I'll have the full outlook after Sport Mitch. OK, see you then. Thank you, Jane. A club is under fire for refusing customers because they spoke in a foreign language. See what happened next on 7 News. Also ahead, Labor's so-called mean girls hit back over the death of Kimberley Kitching. And the stars who shone as red carpet fashion returned in force to the Oscars. A St Kilda pool hall owner is under fire for asking two men to leave because they weren't speaking English. A complaint is now being made to the Human Rights Commission. A shock in any language. Told to leave a St Kilda pool hall for not speaking English. If you speak foreign language inside, it's, it annoys everyone. Today, pool hall owner Aziz Ismail was standing by his decision. They came in through the door speaking a foreign language, loud with each other. And as I was doing something on the till, they continued speaking. To me, this is very rude. 
Last month, the men were in the venue speaking Hebrew to each other. The owner told them to leave because it was a members-only night. When they challenged him, as is Ismail admitted, it was because they weren't speaking English. What happens when people don't understand your language? You feel that, yes, you can speak and you that, 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 from one end of the table, and everybody in the room is annoyed. Aziz Ismail has run the venue for 18 years. He says over that time, there's been numerous occasions when he's asked people to leave for speaking another language. Speaking they are time. going to come in and they are going to disturb and annoy my customers, then I have the right to kick them out right away. The Anti-Defamation Commission will take the matter to the Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission. If we accept this, then people who look different or speak different or behave differently are going to be rejected. And that is a very slippery slope. The pair has made Melbourne home and say the experience humiliated them. This is a country of foreigners. Many foreigners are here and no one deserves to feel what they felt that day. Cameron Bow, 7 News. Federal senators have paid tribute to the late Kimberly Kitching after her sudden death at the age of 52. Among the speakers, the women accused of bullying their colleague before she died, including Penny Wong, who declared she wouldn't return anger with anger. In the place where she once sat, white roses, Kimberly Kitching's favourite flower. Life is not fair, is it? The Senate recalled a day early to remember the 52-year-old who died of a suspected heart attack. With her husband and friends watching on, grief spilled over. She was prepared to work with anyone and everyone who shared her vision on the issues that she felt were important. Her sudden death prompted accusations she was bullied and isolated by Labor's most senior women. Grief and loss can be so profound that it can provoke anger and blame. Much of it misplaced, says Penny Wong. I will not return anger with anger or blame with blame. Christina Keneally, another of the so-called mean girls, took aim at those who she says politicised Ms Kitching's death. Those who used to w use the grief caused by her death for purposes other than honouring her life and her work will find no friend in me. With Anthony Albanese ruling out an inquiry into the bullying allegations, Senator Keneally has urged her colleagues to focus on winning the federal election, saying that would be the most fitting tribute to Kimberly Kitching. She was my friend and I will miss her, Val Kimberly. Rob Scott, 7 News. Thousands of people have demanded the impeachment of Peru's president, Pedro Castillo, during demonstrations in Lima. Clad in the national colours of red and white, protesters briefly clashed with police before being allowed to march on. Castillo is facing an impeachment vote in national parliament after three separate corruption investigations. An out-of-control fire in Colorado has forced 20,000 people to be evacuated from their homes. Nearly 650 hectares have been scorched by the blaze, with 200 firefighters working to contain it. So far, there are no reports of injuries. It comes just months after a similar fire ravaged nearby neighbourhoods. And researchers admit they have no idea why a group of tiny islands in Portugal keeps on shaking. There have been more than 14,000 small earthquakes in the past week. Many locals have already fled, fearing a volcanic eruption. The Oscars red carpet wasn't as dramatic as the ceremony, but still had plenty of attention-grabbing moments. Many stars chose to make bright, colourful fashion statements. Fashion back in full force. Black making way for a kaleidoscope of colour. Nicole Kidman's blue was a special request to designers. My dress is our money, but I really wanted to wear blue. Classic red, a top pick for leading ladies. There were plenty of shining moments. <laughs> Best Actress winner Jessica Chastain glittering in Gucci. Kristen Stewart took a red carpet risk in a Chanel short suit. I love that you're in shorts. And Zendaya stunning in a cropped Valentino set. <laughs> After a tough two years for film, the Oscars are back and back in a big way. A symbolic new chapter for movies post-pandemic.
And the men didn't play it safe, choosing sequence and a head-to-toe look for Australian nominee Cody Smith-McPhee. I had Bottega Veneta uh, create a one-of-one one suit. This year's red carpet was bold and definitely not boring. In Hollywood, Natalie Barr, 7 News. The death of Shane Warne has shocked Australian men into action. Next, our cameras are there as two sporting stars put their hearts to the test. That's only coming up on 7 News. Also, how a staggering donation of $45 million will help children. And a police pursuit across the city comes to a crashing end in Melbourne's southeast. Melbourne's La Trobe University has received a $45 million donation to fund life-changing autism research. Late philanthropist Olga Tennyson died aged 92 early last year, leaving the generous gift in her will. She gave us money during her lifetime to establish the centre and to undertake research, but we had no expectation of the size of this bequest. It's one of the biggest single donations offered to a university in Australia. A 17-year-old driver has been arrested after a police pursuit across the city last night. The chase ended when the BMW collided with a truck at the intersection of Dandenong and Warrigal roads in Oakley. The stolen car was first spotted in Footscray. Police followed it through several suburbs from the air and on the ground. The driver ran away from the crash scene but was arrested a short time later. The share market started the week strongly, despite some commodities falling amid news Shanghai is going back into lockdown. Finance editor Gemma Acton has more. Thanks, Peter. The first session of the trading week started well but fizzled out later on. The ASX 200 closing up six points at 7,412. BHP and its mining peers did a lot of the heavy lifting, while technology shares stumbled. The Aussie dollar has held on to its gains from last week. It's still buying just over 75 US cents. While oil has slipped, that's not helped by news that the Chinese city of Shanghai has gone back into lockdown. And while Australians are out of lockdown, we're not giving up online shopping. Takeaway food, groceries and department stores have been the fastest growing areas of e-commerce in the past year. Peter. Thanks, Gemma. It's now being called the Shane Warne effect. Men over the age of 50 rushing to get their hearts checked after the cricketer's shock sudden death. Leading doctors say new technology means a simple 15-minute test could save your life. Billy Brownless and James Brayshaw were shocked into action after the sudden passing of Shane Warne and Rod Marsh. We lost two of our best mates on the same day. Um, it's a heart attack and... You know, I'm 54, Shane was 52. Certainly with what happened with Warney, there's no doubt about that, mate. I thought he'd be going to my funeral. The wake-up call, a leading doctor warns, should ring alarm bells with men. And there is a lot of Australians walking around out there with significant heart disease and they're completely unaware. New technology means there are fewer excuses for men to put off checkups. Using a CT scan, radiologists can now create a 3D so picture of your heart in just 15 see. minutes. Okay, all done. What we're looking for is a narrowing of that tube. That tube okay. is the contrast that was injected yep. into your arm that fills the aorta and fills the coronary arteries that supply the muscle to the heart. This is an example of a blocked artery. They're often fatal because to date, doctors had to send a camera through the groin into the heart to find them. The patients used to have to be admitted to hospital for this test. That's uh, nice and quick, Jim, wasn't it? A very quick, very yeah, quick. A very quick You're feeling all right? I'm feeling good, other than the whack you just gave me on my neck. You look a bit dopey, that's all. <laughs> James's dad survived a heart attack so 10 years ago. A family history of heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smokers, uh, and stress. Death. Stress is also included can Fact. lead to these conditions and uh, cholesterol. <laughs> the scan costs $700 but in some cases is covered by Medicare. The good news is it's a normal scan. Good. I'm serious, that's good. Because yeah, I was just saying to Tom before, you never know. Billy has been referred for a follow-up stress test. Go and see your GP and take your health seriously. Women are great at it, we're not. Tom Brown, 7 News.
Well worth doing indeed and very simple. Sport is next with Tim Watson and Tim, there are developments on Dustin Martin's exile. There are, Mitch. We're live with an update on the Tigers superstar next. Also a special invitation from Geelong for a Geelong, a Carlton legend to mark another footy milestone. The Norm Smith medalist sporting some new skins as a premiership teammate pushes to return. Nick Kyrgios pleases the fans in Miami with another show-stopping performance. And Dan Ricciardo's horror start to the Formula One season rolls on. Welcome back. Tigers superstar Dustin Martin remains on personal leave from the club. Chief football reporter Tom Brown has the latest in time. You've just spoken with Richmond Insiders. Tim, I have directly. There's no timeline currently on Dustin Martin's return. He is meeting regularly with his manager, Ralph Carr. They're meeting again at 7 o'clock tonight. The main issue is clear. Martin is still trying to process the tragic passing of his dad over Christmas. They spoke after every game. Richmond say they're in regular contact with Martin. He hasn't been back at the club, though, since he left last week. This was Damien Harbour giving an update post-game. Justin Martin's a, a wonderful player. Do we want to see him playing? Yeah, but also it's, it is what it is. It's a personal issue and, and we leave it at that. And Dustin's replayed this, replayed this cup ten times over. Tim, meantime, went to the Cattery this morning and spoke with Joel Selwood and Patrick Dangerfield. Just a week after Buddy's record, Joel Selwood will break the all-time captain's games record. So it probably means more to people around me. I mean, I've been very fortunate over the journey to be in good health for a long time. Um, been lucky enough to captain the clubs on so many occasions too. Um, I just feel, yeah, really grateful. The Cats have a big game against the Pies, but Selwood will take the record from a legendary blue. Stephen Kernahan telling Seven News he's going to watch. I've been invited along by Geelong to uh, go to the game, Tom. So, uh, yeah, I, I think... I think I, w I definitely will be, and I'll, I'll be privileged to actually uh, hopefully say good day to the great man and uh, pass on the record to him in person. It'd be really nice to do that. The 226 game Blues captain always thought his record would eventually be broken. I've always wished he had a play to Carlton. I thought he'd fit very well in our midfield. He's hard, he's fearless. Every, every quarter, by quarter time, he's bleeding. Selwood also revealing the Cats players' plan to quickly get off the ground on Friday night. We had a plan in place, um, didn't really go the way that we wanted, but um, we were fine with how it went off. Sources indicating Jeremy Cameron and Tom Hawkins both had to delicately navigate fans carrying mobile phones who were affected by alcohol. It's just an ugly look, I think, whilst it was fantastic, I suppose, from a, a spectator perspective, from a player's view, I think it's something that we can... Um, you know, we could have and, and should have potentially done a bit better than what we did. Tom Brown, 7 News. Buddy Franklin has given his biggest hint yet that season 2022 won't be his last. Footy's milestone man says there's one thing still driving him. With a thousand goals to his name, the Swans' $10 million superstar isn't satisfied just yet. The Premiership, yeah, that, that's, that'd be lovely. Um, and that's what I'll be striving for this year. A flag has eluded the 35-year-old in Sydney, now in the final season of his nine-year deal. But that doesn't mean his playing days are over at the end of 2022. It's the best job in the world and something that I love doing, but um, as I said, we'll just work that out as the year goes on. Does that mean you do it until you can't do it anymore? Totally. Unfinished business for Buddy, who says he's back better and stronger. I felt confident, but I didn't. If, if I'm, when you miss so much football, this year I feel that I'm playing much better football. I feel a lot more confident within my body. A date with the dogs awaits on Thursday night. who will get back Bailey Smith from a hip issue. Still uncertainty, though, around Aaron Norton dealing with a corked calf. Fresh from a career-best 41 disposals against the Suns, Christian Petrarca was in recovery mode at training. Jake Lever working towards a return after two weeks on the sideline as teammates weighed in on Luke Jackson's future, out of contract at the end of the year. He's someone who has a huge impact on our culture as a footy club and to have him as a long-term Melbourne player, um, I think everyone in the footy club would love that. The Dees face Essendon this Friday night, then will be in the stands to watch the women run out on the G for their prelim final on Saturday. When I was 13, 14, this was not even a thing for girls to look up to. Laura Spurway, 7 News. <laughs> a blow for the Aussies on the eve of the one-day series against Pakistan. Mitch Marsh injured his hip at training with the results of scans putting him in doubt for the rest of the series. Cameron Green is set to replace him for just his second ODI match. Game one is tomorrow evening.
late drama for a 10-man Melbourne victory who looked to have the scored the winner in stoppage time against the Wanderers. And Jason Davidson has surely won it for Melbourne victory. But a handball in the 95th minute helped Western Sydney snatch a one-all draw. Daniel Ricciardo's horror start to the Formula One season has continued. The McLaren driver yeah, yeah, retired your, with 13 laps left in the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix because of engine failure. But he remains optimistic ahead of the Australian GP in a fortnight. Yeah, I'm excited to, to go home and compete there. And uh, yeah, for now, we'll obviously keep chipping away. And we can't promise amazing results yet, but um, we've got to keep, keep at it. Defending champion Max Verstappen overtook Ferrari's Charlie Leclerc with three laps left to claim his first victory of the year. Nick Kyrgios is running hot in Miami, even taking fan requests in his clash with Fabio Fognini. <laughs> Someone shouted underarm serve and he delivered. And Fabio says do it again. Kyrgios won in straight set, 6-2, 6-4, to book a round of 16 clash with Yannick Sinner. There you go, Mitch. Busy day in sport. Good on you, Tim. Thank you very much indeed. Jane is next with the forecast. And, Jane, how does it look tomorrow? Well, Mitch, despite the late sun today, we're looking quite grey tomorrow. The full details are next. Millions up for grabs in an election budget blitz. Cash handouts, petrol relief, tax cuts, pensions. Know what it means to Victoria. Know what it means for you. Also, Melbourne's famous flower and garden show. An exclusive sneak preview behind the scenes. 7 News at 6. Hello again. The day ended with sunshine, but grey skies are set to return. It was a gorgeous sunrise, and then we were covered in cloud for much of the time. 24 was the peak in the city before a week cooled change, and that produced a weak line of showers over these northern and eastern suburbs. They wet the ground, but it was less than a millimetre into the rain gauge. Thunderstorms developed up on the ranges to our northeast, while sunshine returned to those around the bay. It was a top of 28 in Yarra Glen. Now, there's no more rain in the Melbourne area for now, we are looking dry this evening. A trough is bringing the cool change and it's slowly coming in from the west. It is a band of cloud, but underneath that this afternoon, there are thunderstorms near the central and eastern ranges. The rain directly under these storms now around Mount Buller can be heavy. It is only a weak change as the cold front part has remained well down to our south. The remains of Cyclone Charlotte continue to bring rain to parts of Western Australia, while a new low developing off the east coast here is the start of the next significant rain there. Our next cold front approaches tomorrow. So the east coast low brings extreme rates of rain to southeast Queensland and northeast New South Wales. Then there is days of wet weather further south all in through here and a bit of that should push around the corner into Gippsland. There's still plenty of rain to come in the west of the country but in western and northern Victoria there's not much at all. Around the nation tomorrow, heavy storms in Brisbane Brisbane and Sydney that can lead to flash flooding. Canberra right on the edge of that with not much. It is a dry day in Hobart, top of 23, before showers at night with the front. Lots of sunshine in Adelaide, it doesn't hit them, top of 25, and there is the risk of thunderstorms in Perth. To Victoria, areas of fog in the south. Now that lingers as grey low cloud for much of the day. You can see the white there in central and southwestern parts, potentially drizzly underneath. Wispy high cloud coming into the far east of the state, so it is sunnier and warmer in Sale than it is in Warrnambool, and sunny and warm across the north. Closer in, we'll wait to grey skies that linger through the morning and early afternoon. There may be some drizzle underneath the blue there, mainly in western suburbs. Then sunshine returns in the late afternoon. The city has a top of 22. Expect grey skies for much of the day with the potential for a bit of drizzle. Then head out late afternoon if you want the sunniest part of the day. To the eight-day outlook, it is grey again on Wednesday, a top of 20. We are looking at showers developing during the late afternoon and continuing at night, zero to five millimetres across the Melbourne area. It is 20 then for the rest of the week. We've got a bit of drizzly showers coming through during the day on Thursday. On Friday, still quite
quite grey, a patch of drizzle in the morning, then some sunny breaks during the afternoon. Now a bit of that grey could continue into the weekend as Gippsland gets that rain, so there is the potential for some drizzle here, but nice sunny breaks and moving back up to 22 Sunday and Monday. 22 tomorrow, grey for much of the day, and then sunny breaks late in the afternoon, Mitch. That'll Not be nice. Much above 20. Okay. <laughs> no. Thank you, Jane. We get the idea. Now here's what's on Sunrise tomorrow. Thanks, Mitch. Tomorrow on Sunrise, how to prepare for home loan rate rises. Well, you can do now to save thousands of dollars. Plus, exclusive access inside the Oscars after parties. They are happening right now, probably still going tomorrow morning. So see you tomorrow, Melbourne. And that's the way it is this Monday, the 28th of March. Thanks for your company. For now, from the 7 News team, good night. <laughs>